without further ado, uh, let me introduce our first uh, uh, panelists and presenters. Um, first, we will have a paper presented by Dr. Arthur Croker, uh, from <coughs> Science, and Dr. Mary Louise Croker, senior, senior research uh, scholar at PACTAC. And then we will have um, two presentations and responses by Dr. Jessica Dempsey on environmental studies and Dr. Simon Springer, geography. So I welcome you to the panel. Thanks, <coughs> That's very nice to present this morning, yes. first thing, and it's on um, part of this wonderful occasion now, as part of such a great program as CSP do. Yes, and thank you to Payment for allowing me to come. No, I'm not a, I don't have a PhD, so I'm not a doctor. <laughs> <laughs> Our paper is called Dreaming with Drones. The night sky drone is a bullet, an eye, a gut spilling blood. Venus transits and the sun is a distant memory. Two tons of fuel and a ton of munitions. 18 inches and 7,000 miles. Palm trees, the smell of barbecue, surfers, scubers, walkers, runners. A biplane overhead laconically pulls a sign that reads, there's no place like home, especially when it's clean and green. When the sky grew a warlike eye, more than ever, power in the 21st century is space-bound. It's globalized, it's atmospheric, it's instantaneous. It's not really that time has disappeared, but that the medium of time has been everywhere reduced, reconfigured, and subordinated to an empty language of spatialization. That for us is the real meaning of real time as part of the contemporary language of power. Time itself now is an otherwise empty locative coordinate in the spatial networks of digital communication that surrounds us. But if that's the case, if it's the case that power has literally taken to the air, literally taken flight with the technological capacities provided, for example, by drones, to turn the sky into a warlike eye, that would also indicate that the grasp of power of the time of duration, the live time of territorially, of territorial and bodily inscription, has perhaps been eternally weakened. When the sky itself has been transformed into a liquid eye of power, monitoring, watching, archiving visual data, or storage in distant mountain, distant archives, with target acquisition and weaponized drone strikes as its military tools of choice, the greater complexity and intricate materialism of time begins to escape its grasp. Think perhaps of a time of, of distant future when empires, when the usual cycle of rise and decay, crumble to dusty memories, when a collapsed social economy produces an angry mass of dispossessed citizens in the desolate, empty streets, when even borders are abandoned in the global rush for scarce resources, when all that's likely to be left may be those airborne fleets of now fully automated drones, long forgotten by their ground command, but still for all that circling the sky on a hunt for humans. And at, at that point, some historian of the technological past may well begin to reflect on what exactly was released into the domestic atmosphere when drones finally came home. A technology augmented surveillance system under strict political supervision or something fundamentally different. That is, the giving of sky life to a new species of being, being drone, with a score to settle against its human inventors and over time, the capabilities to do something about it. In this time, above all times, a time in which we can finally appreciate what's said to be gained and what's said to be lost, what's utopian and what's dystopian concerning the technological devices that we've engineered into sudden existence, it may well be to remember, it may well be to remember that the story of technology has never really lost its entanglement with questions of religion, mythology, and politics. Early signs of the entwinement of technology and mythology are just everywhere now, as early warnings of what's yet to come, 
namely about that while the contemporary language of technology might have excluded its origins of myth, analysis, and hubris, what drone technology may actually deliver in the future as its most terminal payload will be the return of mythic destiny as the ontology of the sublime order of technology. Consider, for example, the following two stories about drone warfare, one called bounty on drones and the other drones hunting humans. Bounty on drones. In the United States, the FAA recently issued a formal warning to cease and desist to the residents of Deerfield, a rural community in Colorado that was considering a proposal to issue a bounty on drones. And I'll quote under the proposed of ordinance, Deerfield would grant hunting permits to shoot drones. The permits would cost $25 each. The town would also encourage drone hunting by awarding $100 to anyone who presents a valid hunting license and an identifiable pieces of drone that have been shot down." End of quote. So then, a perfect reincarnation of the spirit of the Wild West in the early years of the post-human condition. Not settling for legal niceties and certainly not yielding quietly to official power, some citizens of Deerfield want to do what gun-toting trailblazers of the Old West have always done before them, namely to take the new surveillance trails of the sky in order to bag a hovering drone. Which leads to the question, what happens, what does happen when the drones finally do come home? Not as super tech augmented skybound survivors of hard fought battles in Afghanistan, Somalia, and Yemen, but drones making their first appearance in their homeland as a new form of heightened state security. This time, when aimed less as a scattering of insurgent rebellions in the far off global reaches of the empire of neoliberalism, than as returning drones pressed into service again as the front aerial line in surveillance of domestic populations. Will it be the first symptomatic sign of the power of the new security state, having finally tuned its apparatus of control in the war on terror, is finally prepared to colonize its own population? So then, drones hunting humans. The first of all the violent invasions of drones hunting humans has already <clears throat> taken place. That's the so-called war on terror with his carefully orchestrated publicity campaigns as part of ever increasing popular fear. And in a perfect feat of logical symmetry, its identification by means of the Obama administration's disposition matrix, a changing list of terrorists, perhaps some even dangerous opponents, were targeted by fleets of drones staged, staged in the skies of designated kill zones. According to media reports from, for example, the tribal areas of northwest Pakistan and the adjoining regions of Afghanistan, we can gather some preliminary results of this lengthy experiment test driving drones hunting humans. It needs skill, truly innovative scientific projects that can only seek major funding on the basis of highly experimental proof of concept projects. The war on terror for us might be viewed retrospectively in this exactly the same terms. Here there were mobilized all the design ingredients for potentially successful proof of concept experiment in drones hunting humans. A captive population that can be targeted at will. The necessary long range territorial distance from airports in Las Vegas and Arizona to Afghanistan for field testing lag time for remote control of unmanned weapon systems. Media mobilization of public opinion on the part of domestic populations which is really intended to generate active support for the frequent use of unmanned aerial vehicles in warfare. But more importantly, it's intended to generate a generalized ethical tolerance on the part of domestic societies for excluding targeted populations, whether targeted terrorists or civilian bystanders, families and friends at funeral gatherers, children sleeping at home, from just basic recognition of the right, their rights to reciprocity as human beings. From this purely strategic point of view, this experiment, this premonitory experiment in drones hunting humans that was the essence and is the essence of the war on terror has been demonstrably successful. Not particularly, of course, in the numbers of known kills of enemy combatants. It's always the usual folly of war to expect that seasoned warriors, adept in ways of camouflage and surreptitious movements, could be tracked a little and eliminated by flying robots in the sky. Mm -hmm. 
But in the usual way of things, even major failures like the rashly ill-conceived military adventure in Afghanistan have their purposes. Like any cold-eye examination of the results of this proof-of-concept experiment, the results were strikingly successful in a reverse proportion to the harsh reality of their overall military failure itself. Fleets of Predator and Reaper drones could be controlled remotely, brilliantly displayed real-time videos of actual combat situations, could be provided to elite commanders bunkered down in the command and control centers of the Pentagon, intelligence service, and the White House itself. Captive populations could not only be targeted as required, but as an added benefit, future psychops could be guided by the medical findings that humming presence of drones hunting humans in the sky would accelerate mass psychological depression and thus political paralysis in the targeted population. And finally, domestic populations have quickly and decisively proven themselves receptive to, if not eager participants in, ethical indifference to those identified by the state as fit objects of sacrificial violence. Consequently, when the drones first began to hunt humans in the War of Terror, a complicated calculus of proof of concept was affirmed, one that was at once strictly technological, that's remote control of unmanned aerial vehicles, specular, those live video feeds, the masters of the war machine providing at the minimum the illusion of being warriors, if only Erzak warriors <clears throat> in the games of life and death. Psychological, creating and maintaining a generalized condition of cultural acedia in targeted populations, and ethical, preserving political support for drones hunting humans by intensifying that special designated place of all carefully orchestrated military media campaigns. A perfect blending of moral indifference mixed with feelings of righteous anger as emotional fuel supporting war drones operating under the sign of abuse value. This, in effect, constitutes the technological ontology of surveillance practices that function as the operating system of the new security state. Now that the proof of concept stage for drones hunting humans has been completed, it's only going to involve a slight redesign of contemporary models of warfare for the successful reenactment in domestic space, bar space, of this very same mix of tactics, logistics, ethics, and psychological animus, pulling the doubled ideological logic of facilitation and control by which new technologies are usually introduced, we can already identify the key political markers facilitating the future of drones hunting humans at home. Not surprisingly, everything will begin with securitizing the homeland. Consider, for example, this week's anti-terror legislation with its vast empowerment of the disciplinary apparatus of CSIS. In fact, 10 minutes before I came in here this morning, there was a press release by the NSA accusing CSIS of beginning to hack its database in the United States. <laughs> Canadians are on the move. But not just securitizing the always porous borders in the face of increasingly phantasmagorical anxieties about illegal aliens and sometimes even real suspicions about actually factually founded terrorist attacks but also the much publicized need to securitize dense networks of oil and gas pipelines, isolated power stations, nuclear facilities, transportation corridors, and urban centers against domestic protest. In this case, when the drones come home, it would likely take the form of invisible surveillance from the skies of homeland security, of uploaded warlike drones, securitizing borders, patrolling far-flung networks, pipelines, surveillance, over targeted cities and neighborhoods and homes and vehicles and individuals. The economic insecurity and political anxiety provide in the first instance a necessary condition for authorizing the apparatus of drones hunting humans in the domestic scene. The future will be different. All right, as a counter gradient to drone warfare. When machines break the skin surface, becoming deeply entangled with desires, imagination, and dreams, do we really think that we will be left untouched and that easily discernible divisions will remain among the machinic, the natural, the human? Without conscious decision or public debate, we may have already passed deeply into the enigmatic territory of the new real, 
that space with a price to be paid for sudden technological extensions of the human sensorium may be sudden, suddenly eclipsed by traditional expressions of consciousness and ethics. That in time which the uniform real time of big data effortlessly substitutes itself for the always complex, necessary, enigmatic, and lived time of human duration. When the human life cycle increasingly depends for its very existence on technological resuscitation, how long will the meaning of the human not yield to the greater power of the technological? That's the new real, the future world, that is now where individual singularity has been replaced by network connectivity, where bodies of flesh, blood, and bone have already been surpassed by a proliferation of electronic bodies in the clouds where every step, every breath, every glance, every communication gives off dense clouds of information that are, at once, our permanently monitored past and our trackable future. For some, definitely suffocate. For others, a fully liberated future of transhuman, where the handshake made between the codes of technology and the missteps of humanity <coughs> indicates that we have already migrated into another country another time with sublime possibilities for technologically augmented bodies, digitally enhanced vision, and quickly evolving light wave brains. More than we may suspect, we're probably already living in the midst of androids moving at the speed of light. And why not? We've always been a really, truly adventuresome species. We've always lived at the edge of dangerous risks and practical wisdom a species technologically willing to will its own extinction, while at the same time artistically and beautifully probing the future for points of its terminal abysses and points of creative transformation. It's the very same with the study for us, with the study of the unfolding history of drones. It's really the artistic imagination that displays today the heightened sensitivity to what Martin Heidegger might have described as the new dwelling place of drones at home and drones at war, refusing to think outside the imaginary landscape of drone technology. The artistic imagination today can be so replete with important insight because it actually engages in the material reality of drone technology and its human vicissitudes, not through active imitation or <clears throat> complacent praise, but an artistic imagination that thinks right through all the symptomatic signs of drone technology to discover its hidden essence. Namely, not only what is made visible by drones, by how it's very but how its very invisibility and remoteness actually burrow deeply inside a complex network of human anxieties. Today, a number of contemporary artists globally Act for us as really the leading political theorists of drone technology, exploring in the language of aesthetics the remote violence and equally remote ethical distancing that occurs when unmanned aerial vehicles are purposed by larger military missions. In the contemporary artistic imagination are to be discovered the full dimensions of drone technology as a truly ominous symbol of the times in which we live. It wants a symbol of power that is remote, invisible, weaponized, refusing, in effect, heightened cultural consciousness concerning the full implications of drones. Artists often function as philosophical explorers of what Hannah Rett once described as the negative being at the very heart of the story of technology, a pornography of power that seeks to draw everything today into a kind of obscene visibility a desensitized, dehumanized, really sadistic in its pleasures and cynical in its purposes, <clears throat> opposing tactically the secrecy that surrounds the development and application of military proposed drone technologies, contemporary drone art on a really truly international scale, online and real time, breaches boundaries of secrecy by making its aesthetic explorations fully public to an electronic global community, linking together in kind of a common ethical purpose, both drone artists from different countries that are often targeted by these military missions, and perhaps of greater significance, creating active ethical collaborations between critical drone art 
and actual and most definitely potential victims of the cold violence of those unmanned aerial vehicles hovering in the skies of foreign lands for the moment and soon in the twilight sky of the Imperial homeland. Not a bug splat. And I quote, in military slang, predator drone operators often refer to kills as bug splats, since viewing the body through a grainy video image gives a sense of an insect being crushed. Consider, for example, a recent art project by a group of Pakistani artists called Not a Bug Splat, an emotionally evocative and deeply ethical project that explores what happens when those held under the sign of erasure by warlike drones finally have the opportunity to speak publicly, and in doing so, another language ethics and memory for making the invisible visible, the prohibited image the necessary subject for moral inclusion, and the technically silenced, a suddenly noticeable, deeply insistent subject struggling to be recognized. When the governing ethics of power privileges a form of long-distance ethics constituted in its essentials by a strict separation between decision and consequences, between remote drone operators and the slaughtered people in the fields, then we can most definitely know that ours is a culture that moves <clears throat> at the ethical speed of a bug splash, with all that entails in terms of extremes of dehumanization, desensitization, and pure objectification. Understanding the only effective ethical response to power under the sign of a bug spot is one that suddenly humanizes the field of remote vision and thereby activates an insistent demand for recognition as human beings. Not a bug splat works to facialize Pakistani victims, actual and intended of U.S. drone strikes, to make legible the human dimensions of those condemned to abuse value in the age of drone technology. The artistic tragedy is as straightforward as it is ethically profound, and I quote, the image released as part of the project was taken by a mini helicopter drone and depicts a young girl who lost both her parents in a drone strike in northwest Pakistan. Hoping to instill empathy and introspection, one of the artists of the organizing collective said, and I quote, we tried to replicate as much as we could of what a camera from above would be seeing looking down. We wanted to highlight the distance between what a human being looks like when they're just a little dot versus a big face. And while this artistic project involves, in the first instance, just a simple strategy, remaking a farmer's field in rural Pakistan, <clears throat> isolated, into a large, gigantic art installation, featuring a massive image of a young girl, an image aimed at activating the ethics of remote predator drone operators, drawing her presence into real visibility. The political implications for us of not a bug splat are really universal. Here's a unique, in a unique case of art acting as a counter gradient to power. That hunting image of a young Pakistani girl who lost both her parents and her two young siblings in a drone attack. It really reverses the language of power by critically and decisively reordering the aesthetic and ethical language of targeting. Until this point, the specific targeting of drone attacks was solely and is solely a matter of cold military logic, <clears throat> with, for example, all young males in strike zones considered militants unless there's clear evidence to the contrary, and the local population deemed guilty by association, and a militant if they're seen in the company or in association of a terrorist operative. Working to undermine the antiseptic, radically indiscriminate logic of signature strikes with their unreported but widely documented massive civilian casualties. Not a bug splat works really to subvert the aesthetic language of targeting. Well, it might be just naive to suppose that an image, even really a large haunting image visible to predator drones, would have any real effect on the ethics of their remote operators. This attempt to make suffering visible, to actually facialize those literally objectified and rendered invisible by technologies of violent disappearance, has this really unpredictable advantage. 
for the very first time, the ethical worm turns by a radical reversal in the order of targeting. Suddenly an art installation in a rural, isolated Pakistani field begins to speak to drone operators housed in the remote reaches of an imperial homeland, targeting their ethics, their memories, their most fundamental understanding of the necessary demands implied by human recognition and reciprocity. Now you know, the nihilism advanced by drone technology may be already so advanced that there are as so advanced as to nullify the ethical purposes of the artistic project. It simply might be immune to ethical reflection. But there always really exists this nebulous, fragile possibility that in the face of existential suffering, pause can be given to the most arid, most unmanned of technologies of contemporary warfare. In this case, not a bug splat might best be viewed this is the first of all the artistic experiments in breaking not the sound barrier of earlier times, but the ethics barrier of remote technology. Consequently, in this emotionally compelling project that puts the question directly concerning whether or not shared ethical responsibility can in even the most minimal sense begin to triumph over the singular purposes of drone warfare, surely for us rests the last and best hopes of a suffering, deeply colonized, and nihilistic humanity. Terror from above. Let me tell you a story, a bedtime story. Let me tell you a story of predator drones with giant wings equipped with hellfire missiles and light of God lasers choking the skies over northwest Pakistan. Let me tell you a story, a daytime nightmare story of grandmothers as bug splats and children as double taps. Let me tell you a story, everyday story, of terror from above. Villagers burn body parts strewn over cultivated fields. Let me tell you another story, the official story, a drone warfare story. Let me tell you a story of precision strikes where no innocent is mutilated, incinerated, or murdered. Let me tell you a story, but we know this story is a lie. So to conclude, Weapons of invisibility. Surveillance power increasingly functions by moving from the center of human attention to its peripheries, invisible, ubiquitous, waiting. Now it's no longer so much a matter of people having to walk into the field of machine and vision, <clears throat> as in the age of street level video cameras, but a dense, ubiquitous, always present machinery of surveillance that electronically scans landscapes carefully monitoring the daily habits of life of its inhabitants, watching for selected disturbances of the field of vision, which might potentially trigger a violent technological reaction, drone strikes. In this case, surveillance power, in the case of drone technology, is no longer limited to a list of potential targeted, listed on what the National Security Council calls the disposition matrix, but something more menacing namely the harvesting of entire populations under the sign of a generalized disposition matrix. People who are deemed to be in a permanent state of suspicion, ourselves, by associations no matter how accidental, by physical proximity through a wedding, a funeral, a community gathering, by the simple geospatial fact of where they happen to live. When surveillance migrates from, the, from visible technologies to invisibility, from reliance on human disturbance of machinic vision to machinic disturbances of individual experience. This means that we're living in an area of truly space-binding power, always hovering on the peripheries of life, always bracketing the lived time of those inhabitants held under suspicion by the prospect of an immediate sentence of death from the air. What does it mean then? when the power of surveillance is no longer limited to visual scans of always threatening and threatened populations, but when surveillance itself incorporates the politics of life and death. Equally, what's meant when entire theaters of war in the contemporary era themselves retreat behind a shield of invisibility, unreported, unexamined, undisturbed? What's implied in effect by the present state of affairs when the concept of invisibility has itself been weaponized? Well, technologically augmented society likes to pride itself 
from being this hyped up culture of connectivity with bodies seemingly everywhere generally globally mobilized by social media into always open data points, the reality of the new invisibility associated with technologies of surveillance would intimate that in the most, fun excuse me, in the most fundamental sense, we're actually already radically disconnected from some very essential knowledge. Perhaps what we are most disconnected from is the sudden transformation of weaponized invisibility, surveillance technology in the form of drone strikes into a key expression of the psychoontology of the times in which we live. Drone strikes is really being towards death. The political implications of drone strikes as weaponized invisibility has been brilliantly explored in the aesthetic work of the British artist James Bridle. In an interview with the BBC, Bridle noted that his art is, and I quote, in exposing the connection between secret surveillance, power projection, and new technology through installation. And he goes on, it's very strange these days when we have no idea of the battlefields on which war is being fought. But at the same time, we're built technology that allows us to see the whole world on our phone. I wanted to use these technologies to make visible the contemporary battlefields, those drone strikes. Working in the language of social media, one of Bridal's aesthetic projects is Dronestagram, repurposes Google Earth into a visual cartography of actual drone strikes, including location, frequency, and timing, that are then circulated through the electronic veins of social media, from Instagram to Twitter. Here, one medium of social communication is creatively redeployed as a way of drawing into visibility another medium of social destruction. And not just Jonestagram, but there's also another interesting project that Bridal has initiated that has a larger collective purpose, namely to create public awareness of the material realities of drone strikes. Titled Drone Shadows, this project, based on active collaboration between Bridal and a Norwegian artist, replicates perfectly scaled chalk drawings of drone shadows in the streets of many cities of the world. As Bridal states, one way of looking at drones is as a natural extension of the internet in terms of allowing sight and vision at a distance. Their avatars are the net for me. Or as one insightful commentator has noted, and I quote, in drone shadows he draws a chalk outline to scale of a different drone each time highlighting that not only do they not cast shadows, but from vast height, but they operate at what they are being here among us, very literally and unseen. In a larger sense then, Bridal's overall project, what he describes as the new aesthetic, whether drone shadows or dronestagram, focuses on a really complex entanglement of technology and warfare as the essence of contemporary invisibility by creating shadows for that which is literally without shadows, by visually mapping that which is to remain, which is to remain unmapped. As his artistic imagination probes the consequences and meaning of invisibility itself. In so doing, the project renders the question of invisibility even more complex in another way. While drone strikes can be mapped, and drones themselves made to cast chalk-like shadows on city streets, what about those other invisibilities, those growing invisibilities of language and culture and ethnicity, and race and class and geographical location, the invisibility of life itself? Why is it that so much of what is visible today has in fact suddenly been rendered invisible? Why is it in the end that only certain expressions of human, visi of human visibility targeted bodies in the tribal lands of Pakistan and Yemen and Somalia are dragged out into the violent visibility of otherwise invisible technologies of surveillance. Have we really reached a cultural and then political breaking point into which the meaning of visibility and invisibility have entered into a more complicated mediation, one in which the question of visibility will increasingly rely on a greater political ordination? Well, all the while, those other human invisibilities, differences of class and race and ethnicity and life itself, are allowed to disappear into the remainder, are allowed to disappear into the category of human remainder, subject to abuse value. 
right here. And of course, there's also this curious purely aesthetic paradox, namely that the act of making visible those hidden warfare invisibilities of predators and reapers and global hawks does not rely on anything particularly high tech, but on two other expressions of much more urgent technologies. The simple act of drawing chalk outlines of drones on city streets, and the very public act of mobilizing public, global public participation in the art, finally, of beginning to make drones visible. Thank you very much. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Jessica Debsey, and I'm relatively new at the University of Victoria. I'm just in my second year as an assistant professor here, and I'm really happy to be here um, and to have this great paper to comment on. I thought I would just start by saying a few words about myself and the kinds of questions I asked so that it makes maybe a little bit more sense of how I comment on the paper. So just for a couple of minutes. And Payman, feel free to wait if I go over time, which I don't think I will, but just let me know. Okay, so um, I spent most of my um, academic, but also a lot of political time and energy thinking with something very different than drones, actually thinking with biodiversity. Um, may not get more opposite, you would think, from uh, drones. So thinking a lot about biodiversity loss, biodiversity conservation, looking a lot at international law and policy, working with all different kinds of organizations who themselves want to make biodiversity loss and conservation something other than a liberal environmental crisis, something other than a crisis of, liberal, of elite concern, something other than wilderness. Um, so I've done a lot of thinking like that. And it's a, it's a really rich time to think with biodiversity as well, because given this sort of determination that we uh, live in a full planet, or what people are calling the Anthropocene, there's a lot of rethinking going on around biodiversity. And so the kinds of questions that I think we need to ask are, you know, what kind of problem is biodiversity loss? Is it a kind of violence? perhaps, as Catherine, geographer Catherine Yusuf recently suggests, and if so, if it's a violence, then to which humans, where, is it a kind of universal? Um, Dominique Lestel recently called biodiversity, biodiversity loss um, a major impoverishment of what it means to be human, which is actually has a lot of resonances with what I think Arthur and Mary Louise are saying. She says it's a major impoverishment of what it means to be an animal, a drain on our imaginations, and she argues that this results from the hatred of the animal world cultivated by Western humanism. So this is her suggestion. Or is biodiversity loss something we might call an outcome of imperial ruination, to draw from Anne Stoller, who doesn't put her eyes on biodiversity, but I use her to think about biodiversity loss as well. So these are different ways that we can sort of ask questions about what kind of problem biodiversity loss poses to us, and these are questions that I think are important to be asking now more than ever um, because a lot of the mainstream conversation around environmental crisis is sort of turned towards a utility um, uh, focus. Um, so that's just to give you where I come from and the questions I'm asking um, uh, so you can understand. So drones were definitely thinking something very new for me, but it was really Fun, um, not fun, I'm sorry, that's, that's <laughs> like my elite status here, <laughs> drones are fun. Um, but it was, my mind was actually really blown with the suggestive theorizations of Arthur and Mary Louise in their, um, in their paper, as well as trying to like get my head around the sort of materialities of these drones themselves. And I spent way more time than I should have, I'm not teaching this term so this might explain it, um, like going into drone websites actually, and like looking at drones and like trying to sort of get my head around them. And the one that I was really stumbled upon that I like was interesting to me was the Drones for Good. Have you seen that website? Drones for Good. Yeah, so Drones for Good website. Um, also, there was this really interesting piece in the Atlantic just a few days ago, which just strangely enough came through my Facebook feed, which was like Afghani carpets. Like, so people in, in Afghanistan making like 
carpets with drones on them. So just all these ways, once you read something, then all of a sudden drones are everywhere, and they're like, drones are, um, which they are everywhere, and we don't see them until you are aware of it. So this is what's so great about this paper as well. So I'm really thanks again for thinking our political moment through drones, this very rich techno-scientific object to think through. Um, and there's lots to think about in the paper. So, so now I'm gonna go into the paper. Um, to sort of raise a few questions uh, about it. So drones, Arthur and Mary Louise describe, and so here are some quotes from the paper just to maybe crystallize. They describe them as liquid eyes of power, their warlike eye. Drones are a quote, pornography of power that seeks to draw everything into obscene visibility, desensitized, dehumanized, sadistic in its pleasures, cynical in purposes. So that's a quote. They represent a kind of power that's cloaked in invisibility, but that's really capable of this targeted visibility. And so for me, one of the most exciting parts of the paper, which maybe didn't come out in the presentation as much, was the way that you actually kind of speculate into the future in a sort of science fiction kind of way, this future of this drone species. Um, and so we're being asked to in the paper to really consider the agency and the subjectivity of the, of the drone as well. So they say in the paper, drones are, this is a quote, these are terms they use, are vengeful with a score to settle. They're machines with an attitude. They have real subjectivity, which I wondered what the real men in that. Real subjectivity, not fake subjectivity. Um, filled with, and these are quotes, filled with revenge, mistrust, resentment. They have perverse intentions. So this uh, subjectivity of the drone is really rooted in a militaristic history. Right, um, a form of subjectivity that the paper kind of suggests it actually can't escape. It's like trapped in that in that form. I'm going to come to that in, in the end of the paper or in the end of what I'm going to say here. Um, but yet these drones are doing other work, and this is where this drones for good website is. So there actually are drones have other origin stories. I guess is what I want to um, raise. Or do or do drones actually have other origin stories that we need to grapple with, and why might that matter? I watched um, an Al Jazeera documentary last night. It was very short, and it was about drones that are being used to um, draw attention to corporate encroachment of national parks in Sumatra, which are imperiling um, orangutans, and not to mention all other kinds of, of the rich biodiversity that is really being eroded as we speak with and the same processes that have been happening for a very long time with monoculture agriculture. So this was these drones that were being used to fly over um, national parks to identify sites where oil palm has actually encroached past their boundaries. So they fly over, they have high resolution, they can actually <coughs> identify where orangutans are if they're in a palm tree and they can rescue them or identify them and then send teams in to actually take these orangutans which are highly um, endangered species. So in the past, these, these parts that of oil palm um, expansion, they were out of sight and out of mind, and now these drones are sort of policing, in some ways, corporate overstep. Now, another drone featured on the Drones for Good website is a drone that's at, uh, um, battling reforestation. It's, that sounds crazy. It's battling, it's fighting the battle of reforestation. It actually kind of uses this militaristic language. It does so by bombing... Uh, seed pods very rapidly into the ground um, that can then germinate and grow trees, um, increasing the possibility for reforestation to happen much more quickly, and of course, um, potentially uh, sequestering a lot of carbon. So maybe a link there to the carbon market. This is actually my bread and butter, this, this area that I study. Um, so the other example of drones actually doing science, going out and collecting in swarms of drones. Actually, they design them like insects that actually land on water and collect water samples and then can fly back. So drones doing science. You've got drones hunting humans, hunting rhinos. So drones that are being used to combat poaching um, of endangered black rhinoceroses in Africa. So this is very strange thing, drones hunting corporate offenders, drones doing science, drones hunting humans, hunting rhinos. There's all kinds of drones doing all kinds of things. And this is not to say that any of these drones are benign at all, or uh, uh, this is a sign of maybe what we might call green militarism. 
or more like liberal environmental drones operating kind of like trustees sort of managing the outfall from um, global uh, capitalism. Uh, but all I want to do here is really suggest that maybe there's not a drone subject, but drone subjects. Um, the many lives of drones. So that it's not being drone, but maybe being drones. Um, and I'm not sure if that's important or if that detracts or not, but that's really just a, a question that I had. And part of my um, having this question uh, comes from going back and rereading the Cyborg Manifesto, which is actually 30 years old. It was written in 1985. Um, I was seven. <laughs> <laughs> and it's amazing, actually, essay to go back and read. It was a really big one for me um, in graduate school. Um, and it was really nice to go back to it. And of course, um, in that essay, Although I'm not sure how many people have read it. How many people have read that essay? Oh, like everyone, right? It was an interesting essay to go back to and think about your paper with it. Um, because for her, the, the cyborg is, it's, also, it's a metaphor, but of course we've heard it's always material as well. Um, and it's a way for her to get into tricky questions around feminism of the time that were going on to sort of poke and prod at the origin stories that for her were really hampering a kind of socialist feminist solidarity that she felt feels like it's really needed in our times and I would say it's still really needed in our times. Um, uh, the cyborg for her is appeal to sort of root politics in a much more complex nuanced terrain away from pure revolutionary subjects or pure oppressive subjects, right? Okay. Um, for her it's about, and this is a quote, a need for transgressed boundaries, potent fusions, dangerous possibilities, which progressive people might explore as one part of needed political work. Did that feel really naive to hear that now? That's one thing I felt after I read it, I was like, whoa, maybe she's really naive. Or maybe just the times have changed, right? We can't just take everything she said. So I think there's some interesting questions to ask about using her essay in relation to, to, to questions about this new techno-scientific object. Um, so right, the cyborg is not only a metaphor in the essay, she's talking about different technology and really technology, she wants to really invite feminists and progressives into the possibility of different relationships with science and technologies. And she really means that. Um, she writes, uh, a, this is a quote, and it, this is resonant to the drones. She says, quote, a cyborg world is about the final imposition of a grid of control on the planet, about the final abstraction embodied in a Star Wars apocalypse waged in the name of defense, about the final appropriation of women's bodies in the masculinist orgy of war. This sounds, it, to me, after I, I felt like there was a lot of resonances with um, the arguments being made in the paper. Um, by Arthur and Mary Louise, but then she wants to trouble that, right? She wants to push that perspective. And here's where I think there might be an interesting place for a conversation. And here's what she says. She says, quote, a cyborg world might be about lived social and, and bodily realities in which people are not afraid of their joint kinship with animals and machines, not afraid for permanently partial identities and contradictory standpoints. And so then she goes on to ask these questions about possibilities for alliances, like very concrete alliances, around feminist uh, science and the idea of like a, a socialist feminist science and technology politics, an alliance with anti-military science facility conversion action groups. These are these words that sound maybe out of date now. Um, she's like many scientific and technical works and, and people, workers in Silicon Valley do not want to work on military science. So here she's suggesting a resistance to the masculinist orgy of war is not only in making drones and the work of drones visible, but actually coming to control drones and to really seize the tools of the drones. Um, and later in the essay, she says something that I think might be interesting to talk through. She says, we need to be careful to avoid technological determinism, arguing that we are dealing with a historical system depending on structured relations between people. So here's this a question, like, uh, is your, in, in your work, I, I felt a little bit in the paper that, you know, that the technology itself and it becoming drone, being drone, like taking on this subjectivity is also, might sort of turn into a bit of technological determinism in some way. Um, later she goes on, and this is her most famous quote, maybe from the essay, she says, cyborgs are, of course, quote, the illegitimate offspring of militarism and patriarchal capitalism, but, 
And she wants us to really be open to this. Illegitimate offspring are often exceedingly unfaithful to their origins. Their fathers, after all, are inessential. So here she sort of like wants us to sort of, so I think that that quote is actually really, has a bit to say about the drum paper, but I do think that there's danger in sort of taking what she says and talking about this this technology that was not at play when, when she was writing. And, and in some ways, when you think about a lot of her work around GMOs and biotechnologies, a lot of those feel actually quite quaint compared to drone, drones, right? You're sort of like, whoa, GMOs are actually kind of okay, right? You know, when you start thinking about something like a drone. So I think that there's there's just questions that um, we might raise, and um, I will leave it at that. Thank you. Simon Springer from the Geography Department. Like Jess, I am relatively new here as well. We actually went to orientation together <laughs> basically the same day, so we are comrades in temporality. The time we've spent here. Um, so, the fallout, invisible geographies beyond the liquid eye. Uh, I want to thank Arthur and Mary Louise Croker for providing such a beautifully written and passionate critique of drones and the impacts they have on our contemporary political landscapes. This is a rich and engaging text to be able to draw from. And I've been inspired to think critically and in new ways about the current moment of violence in our world. There is both compassion and rage found within their prose and the vis visceral connection we all share to what they call the practical entwinement of technology and mythology is made in an emotive and deeply personal way. As a critical geographer, most of all, I was impressed to see the central location of space in their analysis of the present and the way that drones are seen as reconfiguring our understandings of geography. It's no secret, at least to geographers, that the spatial turn being felt across the social sciences is only building momentum. The Croker's essay contributes to the ref reflexivity of this process and adds particularly to the encounter between violence and space. I've been researching the theme of geographies of violence for over a decade now, and it's heartening to see recognition for the spatial implications of violence outside of my own discipline, particularly when the political realities of current technology have forced us to think and act in different ways. Often this means disconnection, alienation, and separation, but this need not be the case. In sticking a claim for familiarizing ourselves with the geographical implications of violence, my own practice is a pursuit not of morbid fascination, but rather of attempting to think through a greater sense of relationality so that more meaningful and lasting forms of solidarity might be inspired. The Proper's essay does much to contribute to this as well. But I'm not without critique. And so I want to challenge them on a particular element of their argument that I think could stand to be thought through a little more, with a view towards understanding and appreciating the intimacy between space and time. Their essay begins by suggesting that, quote, more than ever, real power in the 21st century is space-bound, globalized, atmospheric, instantaneous. It is not that time has disappeared, but that the medium of time itself has been everywhere reduced, reconfigured, and subordinated to the language of spatialization. I think it's critically important to begin by recognizing that power has always been tied to space. Indeed, political geographers have long made the argument that power is utterly and absolutely inseparable from geography. It is difficult to find a language wherein one might even begin to conceive otherwise, as the application of power is rife with geographical metaphor. I think the Croakers would probably agree, and so this isn't the point that I wish to push. 
Instead, it is the suggestion that time has somehow become less important than space that troubles me. Enlightenment thinking has long encouraged a separation of the two as, a sing as singular experiences, but this is not the only epistemological view of space and time that one might conjure. There are a great variety of thinkers, both, both historically and into the present, from astrophysicists to the Aztecs to anthropologists who have recognized that space and time are fundamentally inseparable. There may be occasions when it becomes politically important to draw a separation between the two, but I would contend that the case of drones is not one such instance. When the sky itself has been transformed into a liquid eye of power, the Croker's right, monitoring, watching, archiving visual data for storage in distant archives, with target acquisition and weaponized drone strikes as its military tools of choice, the greater complexity and intricate materialism of time escapes its grasp. I can't actually agree with this idea. The watching is occurring in time and across space. The liquid eye of power is not an omniscient view from nowhere, which is indicative of a dematerialized godlike fantasy. Instead, power is located, both temporally and spatially, Empires wax and wane, a mer mercurial process that is as much a reflection of the hold of history as it is the grip of geography. More immediately, drones exact a periodic flyover in particular sites, a pass-by that brings surveillance and lim liminal moments of terror. Drones represent an invasion, not a pervasion, of human experience. There is not a complete and transcendent surveillance, at least not yet. Wild spaces still exist, temporary autonomous zones take flight, time can be rendered feral in a multitude of ways, and as for myself, I don't worry about the liquid eye viewing me when I climb under my covers to sleep at night. Sure, I don't worry. That's all well and good, but this says something about my positionality and the place I live. The hauntology of drones still terrorizes particular parts of the world where others don't enjoy the same peace of mind. This is the importance of geography, a geography that links time and space. So why not drone strikes in Victoria? Why not me? Why not now? This colonized space we presently stand on saw its own abominations, a process that is of course ongoing. Yet the resonance of colonialism as it is felt in Victoria here in 2015 is different than it was in the same site of Camusac in 1843. What about tomorrow? Will drones one day rain their terror down on the inner harbor? We'd like to think not, but I'm also sure that in 1965, the people of Cambodia didn't envision that the next 10 years of their lives would see a new type of monsoon, one characterized by the deluge of American napalm. But that was there and then, and this is here and now. I'm not wanting to make an ominous prediction, and nor do I want to make a deadly promise that I cannot and do not want to keep. What the future holds is anyone's guess. I simply want to remind folks that space and time are irrevo irrevocably connected. So it is true, as the Croker suggests, that the story of technology has never really lost its entanglement with questions of religion, mythology, and politics, but nor has it lost its entanglement with temporality. The intricate materialism of time still matters. It is measured by humanity's pulse, our heartbeat, our breathing, and the way these quicken when drones appear on the horizon. It is measured by the echo that resonate across shelled-out buildings, and the horrible silence 